Mm, 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 mm. Gary. Hello, John. How are you? I'm Welcome great. to Wise oh. Fools. This is the Bible study you don't want. It's not the Bible study you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's even it's even in our opening credits. It's, it's in like, the opening credits. It's like it's been what eighteen months since we started doing this, <laughs> and I still can't get this right. Okay, this is the, the Bible, Bible study, study you, you want. don't want. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Bible study you need. Right. We were just talking about the economy of words, and uh, we I want to congratulate Ray Bates ahead of time. Tomorrow, she will find out that she is the big winner this week in my humor me uh contest she had the best and the most succinct caption for my cartoon mm -hmm. and if you don't know Great. what the cartoon is you have to sign up for garyvarvel.com and and sign up for my newsletter anyway uh, yeah so, it's, it was so a, it was a it was a pool a kid on a diving board but he's dressed in a full hazmat suit and he's speaking and and she had this caption her caption what do you think caption I don't. I don't have any idea. She, I thought she was uh, very clever here. I'm gonna. I want to find her exact wording. Uh, here we go. She said, "Vacations aren't the same since COVID-19." Yeah. Get it because she's wearing a full hazmat suit. Yeah, man, he's, he's swimming. Sw it's, he's swimming, he's, but he's he's on vacation. And it doesn't have the uh, same feel. A couple of the uh, other runners up were, uh, I call this dive, uh, my back to school COVID spike pike. And then, yeah. then there's another one. I might yeah. drown due to lack of oxygen, but at least I'm protected from the virus. It's not bad. Not bad. That's not no. bad. I may drown at the bottom of the pool, but at least I'm protected from, yeah. Exactly, yeah. 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 Um, anyway. Doctor's here. Let's run through the yeah. Sherry's. Here, she's crocheting a blanket. Um, just like crocheting a scarf, except it's wider. Uh, yeah. Marilyn's here. Well, let's see. Uh, Christine's here. Hey, Christine. She's not bringing her hazmat suit to vacay. That's good. Yeah. You're welcome to. <laughs> and and the word watchers here. Um, also, Nancy just slid in so good i wonder my friend uh, ken allen is in we don't see him anywhere he hasn't ch checked in yet hasn't checked Jeff in Lane's yet. here i guess not i haven't seen uh, him but anyway yeah valerie's here that's al's sister Hello, Val. um mandy's here she's making a packing list for vacay <laughs> attendees right now so she's working good nice keep working that's what she gets <laughs> paid for um yeah, so we had a uh, good opener, I think, last week. It was uh, Genesis chapter one was was good, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, I wasn't mean, it? I you you threw me a few curveballs. I hope I wasn't rude, but I was. <laughs> I think I was no, perplexed I so. in some place, which is easy for me to do. I get perplexed sometimes. Well, you were yeah, saying that you were you were watching a documentary on Genesis one this week from what was his name? No, no. Well, my friend uh, Ken Allen suggested I watch some of Chuck Missler's um, uh, expos expository teaching on uh, Genesis, the book of Genesis, and he had seven one-hour parts of just Genesis one. Just for Genesis one went into I had. I, you know, I, you would have to have, I think, a scientific, you know, degree to even understand. To understand it. I mean, it was so deep and, and he is so knowledgeable about this and he's talking pretty fast and, and, uh, I got lost, but, um, I won't be sharing any of that information because I don't quite understand it. But he was okay. talking about time and, and space is not a void space. Actually, there's a fabric of space. And the Bible even talks about that. It rolls mm -hmm. up like a scroll and, mm -hmm. and uh, talked about the ether, and, which is mm -hmm. spelled A-E-T-H-E-R. Anyway, empty space so I, is not empty. So right. I think I watched about three or four of them. And, and I, I was – so I've been studying – 
And then uh, was, I took notes was, tonight. I didn't have notes last week. I, I, I think maybe I'll try to keep us better on track as far as, you know, the scripture. Okay. Probably well, something occurred to me last didn't. week after yeah. we were done um, that the, uh, the ocean, you know, the water where yeah. you know, the life was, the birds and the fish were first and, and ocean, ocean water is a, uh, a thing that seems to have almost uh, mystical properties to it because there was, uh, mm -hmm. I was reading about a experiment that was conducted a while back where they tried to simulate ocean water. They, they took the water out of the ocean and they analyzed it to figure out what all the chemicals were in it. You know, the salt and what made up all the brine, potassium, yeah. sodium, all those things. And so they, they created um, ocean water based on the chemical makeup of actual ocean water. They made simu simulated ocean water. And mm -hmm. they then they put the these single cell organisms mm -hmm. into that simulated water and could mm -hmm. not get them to live. They would not really? they yeah they wouldn't live in the but but when they put them those same cells into the ocean water then they would they would thrive. And so it was that's interesting. Uh, it was really interesting because they had chemically simulated ocean water, you know, to exacting yeah. specifications, but there's something else in the water. Something missing. Yeah. There's some other essence in the water that allows life to flourish. So uh, mm. that's good. I just thought that was interesting. So uh, Marilyn Templeton just posted something. She said she was fascinated by the bear sheet prophecy video that I mentioned and I would encourage everybody else to go take a look at it. And I, um, the guy, his name is C.J. Lovick, L-O-V-I-K. And mm. I'm, he, he fascinates me in, in the study that he's done. And when you count the numbers and all of that stuff, <clears throat> it's fascinating what's in the word Bereshit, which is the Hebrew for in the beginning. And he got to studying this because there's a verse in Isaiah that says, I am the Lord God who tells you or reveals the end from the beginning. So he went back to the very first word and let's check it out. And in the Hebrew mm -hmm. there, you know, the, using the symbols and the nu numerical values of the different letters, he came up with some interesting, interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I wanted to share before we even start here, um, was that a lot of, I've heard this from several different pastors, that it's always been the tradition of uh, Jewish rabbis and people who have studied the Bible in the past that, that God's timeline for the history of man would be 6,000 years and then a 7,000th year would be the millennial reign of Christ. That our time period on earth would be 6,000 years and that would be reflective of the six days of creation and then the seventh day of rest. And now I realize that a lot of people probably even listen to me right now don't believe in the millennial reign. Uh, you know, they don't believe that there's a literal thousand years in which Christ will actually set up his kingdom on earth. I've heard that. Uh, I look at the scriptures and, and it looks like to me it's pretty, pretty evident. And he mentions a thousand years a couple of times in the book of Revelation. I just take it for what it says. But uh, that's one thing. And then the other thing is a few years ago, no, probably 30 years ago, we had a group from uh, Walk, Walk Through the Bible came to our church, and they were just trying to teach us kind of an outline of how to remember things that are in the Bible. And so one of the things that we did just very quickly, and it's easy to, to remember, is the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis is actually the first, first 12 chapters. It's the first chapter is the creation. The second chapter is special events in creation. Third chapter is the fall of man. Fourth chapter, Cain and Abel. Fifth chapter, genealogies. Chapter six, seven, and eight, Noah and the flood. Chapter nine, Noah after the flood. Chapter 10, genealogy. Chapter 11, Tower of Babel. Chapter 12, the call of Abraham. And they put all kinds of symbols with all of it. And the last one was the call of Abraham. So, mm -hmm. it, and it's easy to remember, then you kind of have an outline of remembering what happens in the first 12 chapters. And then after chapter 12, then it's, you know, the story of Abraham and his family, and then Isaac and then Jacob. And 
but and then the Jews. Get to all of that. <clears throat> all of that. So I, oh, I encourage that's... everybody, that's your homework for next week, is to memorize those 12 things. I'll repeat it before we're done. <laughs> creation, special events <laughs> and creation, the, the fall of man, Cain and Abel, genealogy, 6, 7, and 8 is Noah and the flood, chapter 9, Noah after the flood, genealogy, chapter 10, chapter 10, 11 is 11 Tower is, of Babel. Chapter 12 is? 12 is. Call of Abraham. Abraham is called. Right. Yep. Okay. Uh, today we're in, in two, which is a special event in creation. Yeah. Right. 25 verses. Um, why don't you go first so I don't just read? Why don't I just go first and then just not give you a chance to read? <laughs> I goofed up that. last week. I couldn't, I couldn't shut it off. Well, you Sorry. were enthusiastic. Yeah, Gary read the entire chapter last week, and there was like almost, like like almost 30, verses. 33 verses or something like that. He just was. I think when we first started that, we used to just do that. But we, we did. Decided, okay, let's split it up. We, we did, and then we decided to split it up. Whoops. Yeah. What happened here? All right. Can you guys see that? I guess you can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I think there's, what is it, 30? No, 25 verses. So I'll, I'll read, uh, I don't know, I'll read. 13 or 14, and then you can okay. take over. All right, Genesis chapter 2. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden and then dividing into four branches. The first branch was called Pishon, flowed around the entire land of Havilah, where gold is found. The gold of that land is exceptionally pure, Aromatic resin and onyx stone are also found there. The second branch, called the Gihon, flowed around the entire land of Cush. The third branch, called the Tigris, flowed east of the land of Asher. The fourth branch is called the Euphrates. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's, if you eat its fruit, you, will sure, you are sure to die. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed the, from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of his ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. And this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Felt no shame. All right. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for sharing uh, your word with us to give us a glimpse of what creation was all about. I pray that you'd help each one of us as we discuss that uh, your Holy Spirit would guide and teach us and that we'd be able to apply what we've learned and we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So last week we got uh, like a 30,000 foot view of creation and he told us what 
he created on each day. And now he kind of, now the Lord's telling us about a little more detail. He starts mm -hmm. off by ta talking about, you know, he created everything. And on the seventh day, he finished his work of creation. And so he rested from all his work. And mm -hmm. it's not that God needed rest. It's just that he was creating the laws of nature, the laws of everything and, and everything he created in the material world and, and the stuff that we can't see. And mm -hmm. then after he had finished, he stopped creating. I don't think that God gets tired. What no, thoughts, I don't think John? he does either. Well, I don't, I don't think, he, does either. Right. I don't think he, he gets tired. I don't think, I don't think he could get tired. Um, I also, I also don't think that that people would necessarily need to be tired. I think that God built, I think God built that into us. If he mm -hmm. he he could have designed us in such a way that we're we're born and we're alive and we never yes. sleep, he could have done that. But he he has programmed us to, or created us so that we do get tired and we mm -hmm. we need to sleep and i have a theory about that um oh yeah first of all I, yeah well i think that the reason i think that the reason he rested on the seventh day was the same reason that that the creation story is accounted you know is is laid out in a series of days because i think yes. god knew that we were going to need to keep track of time. And so he was giving us a way that we could create calendars and all of that sort of thing. And this, he rested on the seventh day also to signal us, this is what you need to do. You need to take time out, you know, yeah. on occasion and stop creating things and stop working yeah. and, uh, yeah. and relax. Um, I think that the reason that we fall asleep, the reason that we get tired and we fall asleep is to be constantly reminded that we do not sustain ourselves. I think uh, if good. we if we didn't if we never got tired, it would be mm -hmm. easy to forget that we mm -hmm. are not the source of our own life. That we because yeah. we would we would constantly be be able to continue to function. Mm -hmm. But God reminds us on a daily basis that yeah, you're going to despite your best efforts, you will eventually fall asleep. You will lose control of your own consciousness. And at that point, you are completely at my mercy to return to consciousness. You can't wake yeah. yourself up from sleep. You know, you know it's interesting because when uh, Rush Limbaugh was, uh, you know, going through his cancer, and one of the things he said was that every morning he took it, he thanked God first thing every morning that he woke up. Mm -hmm. because he knew that his time was short and that he is there was a chance that he wouldn't wake up and right. yeah that's that's an interesting point that you raised there that's good well it could have been you know we could we could we could never sleep god could have made us that way but yeah yeah every single day yeah, and also i believe that in to exist. our uh, in our uh, resurrected bodies we we won't sleep then we have no need to sleep in our resurrected bodies, right? After Probably the not. No, probably I don't think not. Do. I think that uh, we will be like Christ in uh, in that form. Anyway, we won't be we won't be God, but we'll we'll have the bodies that He's that were like we will, His after the resurrection. We will exist differently. Yeah, and I think Jeff Lane says the devil made alarm clocks. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and the the point is that even an alarm clock. Even an alarm clock is not going to wake you up outside of God's will. Oh yeah, and that's that's a good point too. God literally when, returns uh, consciousness to you. So when the when the anesthesiologist gives you the whatever they give you, uh, mm -hmm. propofol, I think is what what killed Michael Jackson. I, I know when I had a, my colonoscopy, that's what they gave me, and. They said count down from ten. I think I got to eight, ten, nine, eight, and I, I'm out. And and then they have to try to wake you up after that because you're just completely out. And time also thing about time is time seems to speed up because it seemed like I was asleep like thirty seconds and it'd been twenty minutes or twenty five minutes. Right. Uh, if you watch the movie Inception, they make a big deal about that. 
five minutes in the dream is like an no yeah five minutes in the an hour in the dream is like five minutes in reality that's that was the correlation they made so you were only out for five minutes but it seemed like an hour all right i okay. called comcast this week and they worked on my cable but it's looking like it's freaking out again and so if i blink out i will come back well so. you look fine to me is not you are my kind of goofy yeah yours is a little weird so you'll just have to carry on all without right. me okay all right so um moving on to um so one of the things that we didn't really talk too much about it last week because we were just going through the days and what was created on each day. But God was mm. creating all of this stuff for a home for the man and the woman. That's one right. of the things that we didn't really think, think too much about. But he was creating all of this for – now, that sounds – some people who are, don't believe in God, they think that, well, that sounds you know prideful. or But God, we are the only creation, uh, the only ones of his creation that he breathed into – our nostrils, the breath of life and giving, mm -hmm. it made us a, a living immortal spirit. And so our physical frame is made from the dust of the ground. But in verse seven, uh, verse seven. Yeah. Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and he became a living person in some of the versions, like uh, King James, it would say living soul. And I believe that we do have a living soul. That's the immortal part of you. The body will wear out at some point. And if yeah. Adam and Eve had never sinned, if they had never sinned, they had never died. It was, the, it was because they didn't believe God and they rebelled. And when they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that began this, the dying process for them. Right. So man is both physical and he's also spiritual. The animals are physical. They might have emotions, but they're still they're, They don't have a they don't have a soul or a spirit. That I don't see that from anything in the Bible. Uh, evolution can't account for the design of creation, uh, nor they can't also they can't account for man's being able to speak in different languages, or even having a conscience. Those are things that are beyond, no other animal can do that. And the conscience thing, they, they don't even talk about that. But everybody who's alive knows they have a conscience. They have something inside of them that tells them right and wrong. Now, it can, your conscience can get corrupted, but at the same time, uh, you have some kind of barometer or some kind of guide that, that's telling you this. And, every, and God's given that to every person. Right. Well, we have we have an indicator of that in um, chapter two, where God makes puts Adam in the garden and he says, you can eat from all of the trees except for this one tree. Um, mm -hmm. And that was that was the uh, the only chance that mankind had to basically disobey God. You know, they had a, we had the entire earth, the entire garden of Eden and everything. It was literally a land where you could not sin. You could, there was, you could not color outside the lines because it was all, yeah. it was all for us. And so uh, just like, I think God wanted us to remember that we were dependent on him. Um, I think he created that tree so that we could decide whether or not we wanted to be dependent right. on him, whether we could decide whether or not we were going to give him credit for our life or whether we were going to take control ourselves. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't Which, been for the it, tree of in that garden, then yeah. we would not be able to defy God. Right. So one of the things that I noticed here in the text is that he made other trees and they were beautiful and they were good for few, for food. So they had mm -hmm. beauty and they also had function. Uh, but he, he mentioned specifically these two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there, like you said, there was only that one tree. He says, I, I, you can't eat the fruit from that tree because mm -hmm. you'll die. Now, 
uh, and I think, obviously, I think God knew what people were going to do. In, in the political realm, uh, the argument between the left and the right has to do with, well, you know, like we have crime in in the cities. Well, if we gave them a better environment, if we met more of their needs, then they wouldn't commit crime. Right. Here are the two here are two perfect people, created perfect without sin. They're in a perfect environment and they can't keep one law. Not a whole bunch right. of laws, just one. They can't do right. it. And we're descendants from these two people. So I'd have to say that no matter what the environment's going to be, our default is to rebel. And if it says that's wet just, paint, we're going to test it to see if it's really wet. Yeah. Don't touch wet paint. Okay, we'll that's see. A, that's a good point. If you have, you, you can't find a better environment than the Garden of Eden. And we nope. figured out a way to introduce crime into the Garden <laughs> of Eden. Uh, right. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and it was because of it was because of their unbelief. And we'll get into that next week when we talk about the fall and what happened and, and the devices of the devil that deceived Eve and those tricks that he plays are he's are the same ones he plays today. Nothing new under the sun. He's still doing the, he mm -hmm. still has the same playbook. So right. these rivers, there's four different rivers that are mentioned here. And mm -hmm. uh, because of the flood, so like if you go to the Middle East now, in there's the river Euphrates, goes right through the middle of Iraq, uh, or, or I guess it's pronounced Iraq. It's mm -hmm. Iran from Iraq. That's how that's how they say it. But anyway, the U river Euphrates is right there. But because of the flood and the topography would have changed. So they named it that, but that may have not have been where the original was. We don't. There's no way they would know. So when Noah right. gets off the ark, I mean, everything has changed. Yeah. I I, I talked with uh, Jimmy DeYoung one time, who's a prophecy preacher and has a. Uh, if you go to prophecytoday.org, I think it is, you can see some of his material there, and he lives in Jerusalem now, but. Uh, I asked him one time, and I said, what do you think the Garden of Eden is? Because it, it was on this planet. Now, it's been destroyed, but he said, uh, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. He said, my, my gut tells me it's probably Jerusalem. That's probably where it was. That's probably mm. the location because that was where God put man in the beginning and that's where everything is going to culminate. That's where Christ is going to set up his kingdom. And it makes sense that that's where he wanted, or that's where it originally was. And only God would know. That's not important information. It's just trivia. Right. And well, it's not Bible because I can't show you scripture that says the Garden of Eden is in Jerusalem. Right. Right. But it makes sense we to had, me. Well, we had a, I'm going to look this up here. Uh, in the King James Version has a, and I'm not going to be able to find it. Um, While you're looking uh, for uh, that, uh, Sherry asked the question, what would have happened if Adam didn't eat the fruit from, tree, from the tree? Well, mm -hmm. he would never have aged. He would have continued on, but Eve would have started dying. She would have eventually died. Which, you know, that a lot of Eve. people have, have proposed that because he loved Eve, he was willing to die. But then when, when uh, the Lord came walking in the cool of the day and said, where are you? <laughs> and he, blamed, he right. blamed Eve. And then he blamed God for giving him Eve. She was the one who did it. Right. So that went south in a hurry. Um, <clears throat> okay. So here's, uh, this is something that I got from a book uh, mm -hmm. by... I, this is another book by Gerald Schroeder, but it's it was it's called God According to God, and he makes reference to this as being something that was brought out by um, the theologians from antiquities, like the like like Menomides and guys, you know, for really early early uh, Jewish Bible interpreters. And they were in their account of uh, Genesis one and two. 
they they make mention of the fact that God is saying things when during the creation process, he's saying things to the earth. Like in chapter 20, I'm in verse one, or in, uh, in chapter one, verse 20, he says, uh, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures and the fowls. Uh, and God granted whales and every living creature that moves um, throughout the waters. Uh, and that was good. And then he said, and then in verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind, cattle creeping and things of the beast and everything. Um, and so God is, and he points out that God is actually speaking to the earth. And the implication mm -hmm. there is that God has created the earth with the capacity to bring forth life already in it. And so then when he gets down into verse two, God actually scrapes up the dust off the earth and goes his leaves and gets to the business of creating man in his image. Let, let us create man in our image. But for the other things, he speaks to the water and he speaks to the earth and he says, you know, make trees and, and yeah. make life. Right. Um, and I just, I thought that was an interesting observation that hadn't <clears throat> occurred to me before that God put something into, um, creation so that it had the capacity to to bring forth life and then he also says and this is the the king james version he points out that it says in the king james version let the earth bring forth fruit trees bearing fruit and it says it like that fruit trees bearing fruit mm -hmm. and he points out well that's an odd way to put it but according to the ancient commentators of the bible that is what god did. He intended for there to be trees made of fruit that also bore fruit, but that's not what we got. What we got were trees that are made of bark yeah. and they bear fruit. And again, this is what the ancient commentators were saying. The ancient commentators okay. were saying that, that creation was already rebelling against the will of God. That, hmm. that before, before man came on the scene, creation itself was already living or, or it was already doing things in conflict with what God had told them to do. And that also, because the fruit trees were not actually made of fruit. The earth mm -hmm. did something mm -hmm. that was slightly contrary to what God wanted. And so he points out two things. One is that God is um, apparently willing to let creation well, uh, you know. <laughs> okay, John, you're kind of breaking up here. You're frozen on my screen, so I'm going to jump in here. I hadn't really heard that before, and I'm not. Um, um, that's a that's a new one on me. I hadn't heard that that the fruit trees were actually fruit that used fruit, but, and now they're changed since then, or that they were rebelling. I hadn't heard that before. Because uh, I always thought that the first rebellion was actually man, that man was rebelling against um, against God. And as we'll see next week, after they sinned, God put a kicked them out of the garden and put an angel in front of the gate so that they couldn't get to the tree of life. Because if they had have gotten to the tree of life, they would have never died and they would have lived in their sin forever. Uh, the tree of life in the eternal state is going to be there. In the New Jerusalem, the tree of life will be there again. I, I, I've often thought, uh, wondered, um, and I actually thought about a movie, John. I'm hoping that you're trying to get back to us here. I, I was thinking about a movie script that I could write dealing with the fact that the, if the tree of life can't die, that maybe the tree of life is still somewhere on this earth, but God has hidden it so that people can't get to it. Because the garden is not here, we don't know where that's at. But uh, maybe he like the like uh, in my story, in my imagination, that if uh, somebody was uh, searching under the water in the oceans or something, and all of a sudden there's this tree that's growing under the water, that's glowing or something. But uh, and many people have done movies that have to do with a person who um, it doesn't age. Uh, the Age of Adeline was the most recent movie I remember that was kind of that that uh, that way, where this 
woman, she gets struck by lightning in a car crash and, and then she doesn't die. And so she keeps living and it shows how miserable that she is because she falls in love. But then those people get old and die. And now she's left with nothing. And then, so she goes to another place and, and starts her life all over again, but she can't ever get attached to somebody because they're just going to get, and then, and then she's going to be revealed for what she is because she doesn't age. So it's an interesting concept, but ultimately God, yeah. So Christine said she loved that movie, but so God protected us from the, the tree of the tree of life. Right. I don't You're know back. if I'm back yet. You are. Well, back. It's, it's super confusing. Because it, it looks fine on my end. So in, okay. until you say you're frozen, I have no idea because I can hear <laughs> okay. you and everything is great. Um, Cause you're, so but, you're physically over there in Kokomo. You're not going. No, I'm actually not. Okay. You're I'm still, actually not having away. a, okay. having an episode, but the, <laughs> the, the point that the, the rebellion of man is, is um, basically what they're, what they're saying is that, that the tree of knowledge of good and evil well, yes was the first that was the first rebellion of man but mm -hmm. there the implication is that that nature itself was also um guilty of not doing exactly what god wanted it to do and it's a yeah it's it's interesting i i hadn't oh thought of it one before. thing you know we were talking about last week then after last week, um, you know, you, you learn more stuff after we get done. And I, I don't remember where I, if you go to, if you could pull up Exodus chapter 20, verse 11 for just a second. Exodus 20, uh, verse 11. All right. And it says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and and all of that. Uh, to see everything and the in them. And everything that's in them. And on the seventh day he rested. And the, just as I said, Moses repeats that the Lord made everything in six days. I think that's six literal days. Mm -hmm. as Moses would have understood it. Uh, but I know last week we got into a conversation about time and how time was being created, but it was different than what our time is now. And, and uh, so mm -hmm. anyway, just wanted to point that out. So back to uh, mm -hmm. our study. So man had a job, verse 15 at Genesis chapter 2, to tend the garden and watch over it. Now, mm -hmm. there's no weeds. There's no weeds because weeds haven't been created yet. Just everything that God created was good. Uh, and we have no idea what that garden would have looked like. Uh, other than it says that the trees were beautiful. And my sense is, although you can go outside now and you see these beautiful flowers and and uh some people like my wife have, have a green thumb and they can, you know, make a yard and landscaping look beautiful. Uh, I think it's probably the, the Garden of Eden was probably something that is just hard to even describe. The trees were beautiful because I think everything that since the fall and um, after Noah's flood, I think everything was changed. And, and then and we're told in Romans chapter eight that, even creation groans wanting to be redeemed, uh, looking forward to the redemption. So that would mean everything, mm -hmm. you know, the earth and, and the plants and the, all of that. It's just right. an interesting thing that I think that the scripture points out. I think it's interesting that um, God... Um, said that it, he brought the animals to Adam to see what he would call them. Yes. And I, and whatever he called them, that's what they were called. That's what they were called. But that's one of those, that's another one of those things where I think in, in and I have no uh, scripture to back this up, but the, God, oh, John, you're freezing. You're jumping. You're pixelating again. You're not. 
hold that thought uh, while you're on that until you get back. Um, yes, I, that tells me that he had to be so intelligent. Uh, I don't know what percentage of our brain we actually use. I think for me, it's probably less than the average, but I think some people have a huge capacity for brain, uh, you know, especially memory. I, I know a guy, a young guy, who has perfect memory. He remembers everything. So uh, you mentioned like something that happened so long ago, and he can tell you what day it was, and he can tell you he can tell you everything that happened. Uh, there are a few people I know who are like that, uh, but I'm not that guy. Uh, I wish I could remember more than what I, what I, uh, what I can. But, but I think Adam must have been brilliant on an incredible scale. This is before the effect of of sin, obviously. And okay, you're kind of moving now, John, but you're still a little pixelated. Uh, can you hear me? And I can hear you, but you're kind of warbly. But I, I can hear what you had to say. Well, I was, I was going to say that I think that it's interesting that God wanted to hear what Adam called them. Called the animals, similar to the way. Okay. You're still kind bring, of breaking up. You're still breaking up. Right. I can't hear. I can't understand you. So uh, one of the things right. I want to say about uh, while, you, while you're getting your act together there about uh, the tree <laughs> of knowledge of good and evil is that death. What does death mean? Death means separation. So de separation from God. And separation of life ultimately from uh, from the body. So, uh, so there's kind of a three. Uh, some people have described it as threefold. I know that there's a debate about that as whether the spirit and the soul are the same thing. But we, man, I think a man is like a a threefold uh, being in that we have a physical, we have a soul, and we all have, also have a spiritual. And the way I define the difference between a soul and the spirit is the soul is the real me. The spirit is the connection between me and God. So I get the Holy Spirit when I receive Christ. And you're, and you're back. See you, John. Talk to me now. Um, I think Go that it's it. interesting. I think it's interesting the way God let Adam name the animals, similar to the way we let our children name uh, puppies. And yeah, that's good. And it's it's fun. I think it was fun for him to. Yeah to participate in the, the naming process rather than telling Adam this is what the things are named. I think it made God happy to, to kind of wait to see what his children named him. Oh, John, you're breaking up again, and you're frozen. Right. I'm sorry. I wish this wasn't happening because I think you're on a roll there. I think you're right. And I think mm -hmm. what to carry that along was that God wants a family. Why else would he create us? In fact, he describes himself as our father. He And we talk about, those of us in Christ, talk about each other as brother and sister. That's a family. And he wanted a family, and you're right. I think he, he wanted to give him this job. I think it made him happy to see what he was going to call them. And whatever he called them, that's what he called them. You know, that became their name. I think that's cool. I think also one other thing, too, I was thinking is that God doesn't tell us a lot about what heaven looks like because I think that's like a, it's almost like a Christmas present that he's keeping wrapped up until the right time so that we'll be more, even more surprised. So, uh, you know, when the apostle Paul in first Corinthians 12 said that he saw the third heaven, but he saw things that are not lawful for him to, uh, to explain or to repeat. And I think he was warned. You don't tell anybody what you saw here. But it was just for for Paul for that moment. Mm -hmm. So Ray says uh, John gets to talk to Comcast again. <laughs> Very funny, Ray. <laughs> You'll have them on speed dial. That's that'll be cool. You'll, they'll be mm -hmm. in your favorites on your phone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you guys can hear me or not yet. So I can hear you now. I can hear you, but you're a little pixelated. Yeah. Well. Uh, I, I have a, I think we could talk about God creating um, woman for, uh, for man. He looked around yeah. and said, it's not good that man doesn't have a, doesn't have a helper. Yeah. And so he, 
so he made Eve, but it's interesting that he didn't make another, he didn't make another Adam, you know, he made something that's, that's right. different from, yeah. from Adam. Right. And one of the reasons that, that we have difficulty in our relationships, I think, is because we have a tendency to think that our mates are supposed to be duplicates of ourselves rather than rather than something that is yeah a compliment to ourselves yeah. and um both sides and exactly. that that is that's not the way god intended it and so right. it stands to reason that the, that your your husband or your wife is going to be um a different being than you are and mm -hmm. that is going to be that's a that's a, a good thing Mm -hmm. But because we're people and we don't we don't think like God, most of the mm -hmm. time we see that as an annoyance. This person, oh, why, right. why is she the way she is? Why does yeah. he do the things he does? Right, um, right, right. And notice also that uh, in verse eighteen, it was because man was lonely. Of course, when I think God brings the animals to him to see what he would call them. I think he would have had to notice that there's, there's a bull and there's a cow and right. there's a dog, male dog, there's a female dog. And so right. there were differences between all of them and he didn't have anything like that for himself. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that God said it wasn't good in all his creation was he said, it's not good for man to be alone. And that's right. why he created a woman. Um, and so we have the first surgery done. Adam yes. is put under, he's put to sleep. Anesthetized. And the, and the rib, he takes a rib. Uh, I think it was Matthew Henry said that uh, he took it, he took it, this part, not from his head to be the superior to the woman, nor from the foot so that she would be inferior to him, uh, but from his side so that they would be equal. Matthew Henry, who lived a long time ago. Matthew and so Henry. woman woman is the other half of man it's well there's I, an you mentioned that joke you have about the rib i think it's hilarious uh, it's the rib that we used to use to read minds yes <laughs> i think that's hilarious that's good um we had uh, <laughs> we don't have it, that anymore it well it, right we don't do it anymore she but she can um i i <laughs> I, I think that oh, yeah. there's something Christine there. Says, Christine says ribs protect the heart. That's good. And and the rib is close to closer to the heart. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where he took the part from Adam to make woman. Well, there's also something significant about the fact that there's uh, a male and a female required to, to reproduce. Yes. And, you know, you were talking about evolution. Um, a yeah. while back and from an evolutionary from an unguided evolutionary standpoint that is if evolution was just this process that took place and didn't have any kind of you know rational mind behind it um right male and female is a terrible way to it's an it's a very unsafe way to propagate a species it's much yeah. safer and more efficient if a species can just, you know, duplicate themselves. Yeah. Yeah. But if you have to have a male and a female find each other uh, right. and then go through some sort of a process to create life. Right. right. That's, that's dangerous. And yep. so it would, yeah, I, I suppose theoretically it could happen once, but to have that be the standard way that life gets reproduced, including plant life, you know, mm -hmm. plants, have pollen that they use, mm -hmm. but they can't pollinate themselves. There has to be another plant. Right. Right. Um, or there has to and, be bees that, that go around pollinating right. everything. Yeah. Right. So the, so the, the reproductive process requiring, requiring more than one life form is yeah. in, indicative of, of a design, you know, yeah. it was, exactly. it was planned that way. Exactly. So God creates man first. Mm -hmm. And we are not told when he creates the woman. We don't know no. when that takes place. 
We don't know how much time passed. We don't know how much time it took him to name the animals. We're not told. Um, oh. And so God creates man first as, a, I think, as a symbol that he wants man to lead. He makes them equal, but they have different responsibilities. Uh, and God makes them different to make them whole. And along with what you said, as far as propagation of the species, he, he makes them different so that they have to get together in order for, um, for procreation. Mm -hmm. Man is the aggressor, woman the nurturer. There's just kind of a two different natures thing that's going on here as well. Man is the lover. Woman is the responder. Uh, man shows love to his wife. Usually, he, if he shows love to his wife, he... he what usually happens, what's supposed to happen is he receives love in return, uh, hopefully. But uh, husbands, I mean, Romans chapter 5 tells husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. So we have a, a system here where God has God the Father, then God the Son, and then, then man, then woman, and then children. There's kind of a hierarchy here. And the mm -hmm. Son does what the Father says and so we're supposed to all of us are supposed to follow christ man's response after verse 23 when uh he wakes up and he sees woman is whoa man <laughs> that is mm -hmm. that's incredible uh i don't know how he said it but i i got a feeling it probably was an exclamation point on the end of that whoa man and uh and then he he says that she was taken out of man but they're different, like you were saying. Adam named his wife Eve, we learn in, in chapter 3, verse 20, because she will be the mother of all people from that point on. So in the beginning, woman comes out of man, but after that, man comes out of woman for the rest of creation. Uh, I mean, the rest of time. Okay, so can we talk, before we run out of time, about yeah. being naked and feeling no shame? What does that mean? Well, I have a kind of a theory about that. Um, you know, I think that God, and I don't have a lot to go on here other than when when we're, we received our redeemed bodies, it says that we will be clothed in our righteousness. And what does that mean? I, I think that it probably means that we had some type of Shekinah glory on us. And I think that when God created man, that he was kind of the same. There was some, like when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, when he came down, because he had been with God, his, he was glowing and the people couldn't even look at him. And so he would cover his face, but that, that glory was fading. And I think that when Adam was created, he had this Shekinah glory on him. And the same thing with his wife when she was created. So they were naked but at, at the same time, they, they were innocent for one thing. They didn't know anything else. They hadn't eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I think that this was just natural for them. No more than, like if you have like, like my grandchildren or my kids when they were little, they're innocent. They don't know. They, you take their clothes off to get them ready for a bath and they run all over the house. You have to go chase them down because they're not, they're not ashamed. It's mm -hmm. that innocence that... that uh, they had, but when they sinned in chapter three, we'll see they, something changed. And I think that that Shekinah glory went off of them. And then they recognized that they're just in their flesh and they were naked. Obviously when God comes to them, they look different. And I think that that was, that's my theory, but what do what do you think about that, John? Um, yeah, I think that there is, uh, um, I think there is an innocence and they 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 had not they felt no shame because there was nothing to be ashamed of uh, yes. at that point. They hadn't they hadn't done anything that was um, outside of the natural order of things. They were they were coinciding with with nature. Uh, they were in harmony with nature. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it wasn't until they broke God's law and defied God's um, command that they became aware, oh, now they, they knew that they were now out of alignment. 
they weren't in harmony with creation anymore. And, right. and they knew that and how, the, how it, how they understood it was they, they became aware that they were naked. And I, I don't yeah. think that, I don't think the nakedness was the problem. I think that they were, uh, I think that they knew that they were out of sync. I think they knew that they had, that they had broken something yeah. that, that was whole before. And I think that the way that they understood it was they went, wow, we're naked. Um, yeah. And I think that I agree with you when God, it's, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, when God comes into the garden and says, where were yeah. you guys? You know, uh, and they, they said, well, we were naked. Yeah, we were naked and we, and we, so we hid. And he's like, naked, huh? How, how did you? Who told you that? How did, yeah. <laughs> how did you figure out that you were naked? What in the world? Um, so Christine asks a question or she says something about it. in verse 24 explains, uh, it talks about leaving father and mother and they are the first and father. They are and the first. So, yeah. So I think this is where Moses is chiming in. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. You know how I know that? Because that's what Jesus said. Jesus said that in the Gospels, that Moses wrote this. So I take what Jesus said as being the truth. But I think this is an aside. So Moses is much later in time looking backward. And so I think this is an aside saying that for this reason, this is why you leave father and mother and be joined to your wife. Yeah, they were the first ones. They were the first father and mother. But from that point on, now you have this pattern of leaving your father and mother and being joined to your wife and your two are one flesh. And I, right. you know, when I was teaching a young couples class, I would always try to emphasize to them that when they start having children, that the children cannot be the priority between, you know, be over your spouse. You rent children for 18 to 20 years and then they're gone. They're out they're living their own lives. And so your, your primary relationship on earth is with your spouse and children. So, and children have a way of trying to get in between the two, uh, the, between their mom and dad and causing division. You can't let that happen to you. The wife and the, and the father have to stay on the same page. And, mm. and I think that children instinctively actually really want that. Uh, they don't know it. You know, they, they think they want to be number one, but actually they need to be number two. And, you know, their pri this is the way the priority should be in the marriage. Christ first, then your spouse, then your children. And as long as everybody understands that priority, uh, I, I think then, then the, the family unit will operate better than if you mm -hmm. get these things out of whack where all of a sudden, well, whatever the child... If you have child-centered parenting where the child calls all the shots and you're asking for trouble down the road, that's going to that's gonna be a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Too many children, uh, women turn their children into an idol. That's right, Ray. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the husband will get left out and then he starts thinking, well, maybe there's somebody else who cares about me more. Uh, the psyche of uh, humans is, it can be a fragile thing. I try to tell my wife every day I love her because I think she just needs to hear it. In fact, I say, you know, I don't want you to forget. So I just keep telling you, <laughs> got to keep telling her. I love her. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well, there's so, a, we have a tendency to, uh, to believe things that are not true, just like Adam right. and Eve did in the garden. And so yeah. when you, um, yeah, when you're fallen, then you, you tend to think you tend to think that you know best and that's what tripped up Adam and Eve when yeah. the serpent came along and said, are you sure that that's what God said? Yeah. And they were like, well, maybe, maybe that we didn't, maybe we did mishear him. Maybe we've got, yeah. and we do the same thing today. You know, we're, we're unhappy in our uh, re marriage relationship. And so we go, well, you know what? Maybe, Maybe there is right. somebody that I would be happier with. Maybe there is, maybe there is something out there that, that I'm missing out on. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what drives us to make really poor decisions is this right. fear, human, this human, terror. Human, reason, human reasoning based on nothing but feelings and our emotions are, it's the shallowest part of us. 
our emotions come and go. They're all over the place. This feeling that, right. well, maybe I'm not really a man. Maybe I'm supposed to be a, that, that is demonic. And I think it, it, that if you've ever read the screw tape letters, you get the idea on the power of the demonic realm that we can't see that speaks lies into our mind. And then if we contemplate those lies, then we end up making big mistakes. And mm -hmm. ultimately we start, we start doing things that are, um, not biblical. That's why it's so important to read the Bible and and try to grasp what God, you know, the God's plan. In fact, what I was wanting to say here is that if we can get our heads around the first three chapters of Genesis, the rest of the Bible makes sense. If we could just understand the first three chapters, God always existed, God created everything. There's a design to his creation. Uh and that humans are unique among all of the things that he created because he created us, not every, not the other creatures. He created us in the image of him, in the image of God. And mm -hmm. because uh, we sin that we're going to see uh, next week in Genesis chapter 3, paradise is lost. And then the rest of the story is redemption. The rest of the, book of the books of the Bible all are dealing with the redemption of man, ultimately with Christ coming back. When we see in the beginning God creates uh, in Revelation, we're going to see that he's going to stop. He's going to put an end to what's going on. He, we see in the beginning that he creates man. When Jesus comes back, there's going to be a rebellion. He's going he's to depose them. He's going to set up his kingdom. Uh, here, paradise is lost in Revelation chapter 21. We see Revel we see paradise is now back, and God has restored everything. So there's a redemption, restoration, uh, and I personally think we're getting close. I know I keep saying that, but uh, oh yeah, Christine says that Charles Stanley says love is the, is a decision. That's true. It's not a feeling. It's a decision. Feelings yeah. follow actions so once we act in love feelings will follow that's good right sometimes and and when they don't we're still supposed to act righteous anyway even when we don't feel like yeah. it um, yeah you still have to love even though you don't feel like it right and if well, you it, if you act in love mm -hmm. your feelings will come around to feel like it i think i've told that story about dr crane years ago Mm -hmm. who one of our uh, uh, Indiana legislator senators is uh, John Crane. It was actually his uncle. This is a true story. Uh, he had, I guess he was a lawyer, doctor, I don't know, but he had some lady came to him and divorced why. He, she wanted to divorce her husband. And he said, well, it's going to take me a month to get all the paperwork together. So in the meantime, she said, I want to not just divorce him. I hate him. I want to destroy him. And so he said, go home cook his favorite meals, you know, do all this stuff for him, you know, uh, wash his feet. I don't, I, she, he gave her a bunch of stuff to do to make him feel mm -hmm. special. At the end of the month, we'll, you'll present the papers on him. It'll blow him away. He won't see it coming and he'll just be devastated. And so at the end of the month, she did that. At the end of the month, he contacted her. Well, I have the paperwork ready. And she said, I don't think I want to go through with it. He said, what, what's going on? He said, I don't know that. I don't know what happened, but he's changed. Well, he's changed because he was reacting to a different person now who's, mm -hmm. who's loving him, and now he's responding to a different person. And if both parties did that, so marriage is not a 50-50. Marriage is 100, 100, ideally, but if I'm doing everything I can to love and, and meet the needs of my wife with no expectations, then I won't be disappointed. And at the same time, I think that a man who's doing that won't, she won't be able to help but respond with love and kind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for one thing, you married the person. So at some point in your past, you were dating and flirting, and, and, and so you were courting one another and you made this decision. So at some point, it looks like that you had some kind of relationship that you thought was worthy of marriage. Now you just have to work on it. And it doesn't. It's not easy all the time, uh, but if you're if you're doing your part, what Christ says here in Romans chapter five, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Sacrificial love. That's a different kind of love. Uh, then you're going to be happy. I think. I think you're going to have a better result. 
Ken Allen says, great story. Greg Laurie shared that similar story also. Yeah. So, so I think uh, Dr. Crane was in Illinois. And like I said, Senator John Crane's right here in Avon, Indiana. And, a, and he's a friend of mine. And I remember when I wrote that story once and put it on Facebook. And he contacted me and said, hey, that's my uncle. <laughs> I said, well, well I, I wasn't even sure it was a real story. I'd seen it several times in different places, but he said, yeah, it's, it's a true story. It's true. It happened to my uncle. Well, All right, John, this chapter has been two. fun. We're out of time, but uh, I'm looking forward to next week. It's mostly fun. I'm not, I'm not happy getting kicked off of the show, but uh, we're not, we're, I'll we're not call Comcast. Comcast. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call Com the frustrating thing is I don't even know what's happening. All of a sudden you're yeah. just telling me that you can't, you can't. So everything's great on my end. So, yeah. um, well, I'm assuming you know, that everybody else is seeing what I'm seeing. And so that's why I just jumped in. And yeah. I'm sure they are. Know, maybe, maybe I'm freezing and I, I don't know that, but no, but, I think it's, uh, thanks it's everyone me. for hanging in there with us. We, even though we had some technical difficulties and uh, we will see you next week for chapter three. Thanks.